everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to spend some time today talking about the E2 visa requirements and also look at E2 visa renewal considerations. Uh, a few things before we get started. Um, some of you may know that the firm was founded on an E2 visa eight years ago. Our founder, Ian Scott, is in the United States personally on an E2 visa, and the firm has also renewed. Uh, the firm is a full service immigration firm, but we focus primarily on E2 visas. We've processed hundreds of them, and we typically process E2 visas that are higher risk, uh, meaning lower investment amounts. Uh, we've processed to consulates around the world, but our primary two consulates are Toronto and London. Uh, we, will, we will continue this webinar series, doing at least two webinars a month on different topics. At the end of this webinar, we will also send out a few things. Uh, one is the PowerPoint that you see here. Um, we will also send an E2 visa guide, which is a comprehensive guide on various aspects of the E2 visa. <clears throat> and we will send you a link where you can sign up for the additional webinars. My name is Kelly Legrand Wiener. I'm the managing attorney at Scott Legal, and I've processed hundreds of E2 visas over the years. Um, if you have questions as we go through the presentation, please send them to the chat box um, and we will, uh, you know, try to answer those either if they're topical as they come up or um, we'll save some time at the end for questions. Um, finally, this webinar will be recorded and will be made available on demand. All right, so let us start with the E-2 visa talking about some rules and regulations. So the E-2 visa is uh, called a treaty investor visa and is a non-immigrant visa, um, which allows nationals of certain countries to come to the US to develop and direct the operations of an enterprise in which they have invested. Um, so, you know, in order to get the E-2 visa, a threshold requirement is you do have to be um, a citizen of a country that has a treaty with the United States that allows uh, for the E-2 visa. Um, so there's a long list of countries that qualify, um, countries from Europe, Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, um, many different countries are on the list. As I mentioned, we process frequently in Canada um, and in the United Kingdom, but there's also many other countries, um, Australia, <clears throat> New Zealand, and Israel were both recently added to the list as well. Um, if you are going to get an E2 visa, there are two options. One is you can purchase an existing business and make an investment that way. The other is <clears throat> you can start a brand new business in the United States. Another question that comes up is how long your visa is valid for. And this will depend on your country and their reciprocity schedule. So the United States has kind of reciprocity in the amount of time they grant um, to the visas based on what the other countries will grant to US citizens. Um, so for many uh, nationals, that's going to be five years. For example, in Canada, London, five years. In Australia, it's four years. In France, it used to be five years. Now it's recently been changed um, to 25 months. Um, and then there's some countries where you only get a visa for three months. For example, Bangladesh and Egypt. Uh, even if your visa is only granted for three months, you can still come to the United States and get two years in E2 status. Um, so the visa is just an entry document that allows you to, to um, enter the United States. And then once you're here, you get two years in E2 status. And that status is what controls how long you're permitted to stay. If you have a five-year visa, then at the end of that two years, you can just leave and re-enter. <clears throat> or even earlier to the two years, you could just leave and re-enter. If you only have a three-month visa, um, then if you leave after the three months, you know, you'll have to go to a consulate and get a new um, a new visa stamp before you can re-enter the United States. Um, someone's asked a question, can I buy a business in the process of setting up a new one? Um, I'm not really sure what this uh, question is asking. Um, so perhaps if you could rephrase, um, I will uh, look at it and try to um, answer it later in the presentation. All right, so let's uh, dig into some of the other E2 visa requirements. Um, so as mentioned, uh, you know, threshold requirement is you have to be a national of a treaty country. Um, you know, the other, uh, another main requirement is you have to make an investment. This is an investor visa. Um, so there's kind of multiple pieces to this investment um, requirement. So one is that you must um, invest funds that are, so the funds must be irrevocably committed and at risk. 
Um, this means that if you're doing a startup, the money has to actually be spent. You cannot just transfer money to a bank account and say you've invested. Um, the money has to actually be spent on startup expenses to get the business to be operational. Um, that's what it means by at risk and irrevocably committed. Um, you also have to show that there's a legitimate source of funds. So wherever you're getting your investment from, let's say you have personal savings from employment, you're gonna show your tax returns. Um, if somebody's giving you a gift, uh, then you know, you're gonna have a gift letter and then proof of where they got the money. So if it was their personal savings, you need their tax returns. Similarly, if you, um, if you sell a house, uh, you know, if you take out a personal loan, all of those are acceptable sources of funds. Um, one comment on the loan is just that the loan cannot be secured by the assets of the E2 business. Um, so that's kind of one restriction on the, on the loan, um, you know, source of investment. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about um, what's substantial kind of on the next slide. Um, if you are starting up a new business, there are some typical E2 expenditures we've listed out here, inventory equipment, website, office supplies, marketing, office space, setting up your, your corporation. Um, you know, really the expenditures you're going to look at are what do you need for your specific type of business to get everything up, up and running? So it's specific to the type of business. If you have a consulting company, perhaps your expenditures will be on the lower side. You really need, um, you know, some equipment, office space, perhaps. Perhaps if you've hired employees, if you need some software licenses, things like that. Um, whereas if you're starting up, you know, a business like a restaurant or a car manufacturer or something that requires kind of warehouses and inventory, um, you know, you're going to need to make those expenditures to, to show that the business is, needs, you know, the requirements that you've spent everything necessary to get it up and running. Um, let's talk about a little bit about investment when you're um, starting up a new business versus purchasing a business. So when you're starting a new business, you need, you know, you need to make an investment to get the business to the point where it's, um, you know, ready to be operational. So everything that you need to spend um, to get the, the business real and operating. When you're purchasing a business that already exists, um, you have an option to do something called escrow, where uh, the money will still be considered at risk and irrevocably committed if you sign a purchase sale agreement where the only contingency left is the approval of the E2 visa. And then that money goes into escrow. If the E2B is approved, the money will leave escrow and go to the seller. Um, if the E2B is denied, the money comes back to you. So there, that is one way to mitigate some of this risk um, in your investment when you're pur purchasing a business is to use that escrow arrangement. <clears throat> Another requirement for the E2 is the business cannot be marginal. Uh, so th this means the business needs to support more than just the investor and their family. And what this translates to is that you have to hire U.S. employees or you have to hire employees in the U.S. to work for the company. Um, so this is, you know, one of the requirements of the E-2. They, you know, the, the E-2 is not meant for people that want to come to the United States, for example, as a solo consultant and just have a, um, you know, just them uh, working for the company. It really is meant for people that are going to develop and direct a business and hire employees in the U.S., so another requirement is the business must be real and operating. Um, so if you're you know, purchasing a company that's already been operating and you're just going to take it over, you could include tax returns, W-2s, payroll summaries, um, contracts, any proof, you know, an active le lease agreement, um, you know, website, all those things that show the business is already running. If you are about to start a new business and it's a startup, then you'll have um, slightly different documents. You, you know, you won't have tax returns, you won't have W-2s, but you'll have, you know, your business bank account. You should have a website, um, even if it's not live, perhaps, you know, somewhere that the officer can see that it will go live when your business, um, when your visa is approved. Um, you should have a tax ID for the company. Um, you know, maybe you have some letters of intent, uh, you know, showing that the business is going to start operating once you arrive. So if the business is not operating yet, you still need to show that it will be ready to be real and operating once you get that visa. So again, you know, sign commercial leases, proof you've established your business entity. Um, you, if you have a, a business that requires licenses, if you've acquired those licenses, um, you know, that's, that's also uh, you know, helpful for this real and operating requirement. So another requirement is that you show you are coming to develop and direct the E2 enterprise. So the E2 is not for people who are looking to passively own a business. You do have to have an active role in the company. Um, and that role should be one 
of a high level activity. So um, it, this isn't so much an issue with the consulates, but USCIS does um, focus on this sometimes is they want to see that the investor is really going to be doing kind of the high level work of developing and directing the company as opposed to doing all kind of the day to day skilled labor. Um, so I think, again, not a focus of the consulates, but it is just good to be able to show that you are going to hire US workers and that your focus is going to be on developing and directing the company. Um, another requirement for an investor is you need to show that you um, own at least 50% of the, the E2 company um, to, uh, to be counted as an E2 investor. If the company is you know, 50% or more owned by treaty country nationals, um, you know, and you do not own 50% on your own, you could potentially instead be an E2 employee as, a, as opposed to um, an E2 investor. And finally, the E2 is a non-immigrant visa, which means you do have to have the intent to return to your home country upon the expiration of the visa. Uh, it's, it's, not, um, it's not a very high standard, so you don't have to show that you have a foreign residence um, with no intention of abandoning. Usually you can meet this requirement merely by showing that, um, you know, signing a statement saying that you intend to depart. Um, additionally, it's important to note that signing that statement doesn't prevent you from renewing the visa as long as you continue to meet the E2 requirements and you can renew the visa indefinitely. So let's talk a bit more about investment and how much investment is enough. Um, so the requirements are that you must invest a substantial amount of money. Uh, there is no set dollar amount anywhere in the regulations where they say this is what's substantial. Um, what is substantial is going to depend on the type of business that you're starting, um, also where you apply and your particular consular officer, and the overall strength of your case. So when we talk about type of business, as I mentioned earlier, you know, a consulting company may have you know, much lower startup costs than, for example, a car manufacturer or a restaurant where there's some very specific large expenditures you're going to have to make to get those things up and running. Um, so, you know, in, when you look at substantial and they say, have you spent everything necessary to get the business up and running? You know, if you're starting a venture where you say, well, I'm a consulting company, I really just need $5,000 or even less than that, you know, um, that's just going to be too low, really, no matter what. Um, you know, there, there is, it is an investor visa and, um, you know, you can try to make your argument, but really, I think, you know, the lowest that we usually will recommend is somewhere in the range of, you know, around 60,000 with at least about 30, um, 35 to 40,000 of that spent. Um, that's not to say you can't be approved with a lower amount. It may be possible, but it just makes the case much riskier the lower that you go. And it does need to make sense in terms of the type of business you're starting. Additionally, you have to think about where you're applying. Certain places are just less focused on the total investment amount. For example, if you apply within the United States at US Citizenship and Immigration Services, they aren't as focused on whether the investment amount is very large. Um, there are some consulates, for example, Argentina comes to mind where they're just not as friendly to lower investment amounts. Similarly, um, in some consulates, uh, for example, in Japan, um, you know, they see a lot of very large multinational companies who are investing um, and then sending lots of employees. So if a consulate is used to seeing larger investment amounts, it may be harder to go to that consulate with a low investment amount, because even though it may be substantial in light of your type of business, it's just going to look low to them because of, of the normal types of investments they see. Another thing to consider is the overall strength of your case. So if you have a, an investment amount that's on the lower side, you're going to want to have um, other aspects of your case that are much stronger. So perhaps on marginality, perhaps you, you already have contracts in place, lucrative contracts, um, perhaps that you have already hired employees um, who are kind of, you know, getting things running while you're, um, you know, you're getting your visa application going. These are the types of things that can help show the, the officer that even though there's a lower investment amount, um, you know, you're still committed to this enterprise and the enterprise is viable and has the ability to make a real economic impact. Um, so when we look at the uh, substantiality, there is something called the proportionality test. So how much money you've invested versus the usual cost to establish that type of business. Um, so this is where you, um, as the investor, sometimes you can provide <clears throat> industry publications, market research reports, articles to help support that you've spent everything necessary to get a business up and running. For example, if Entrepreneur Magazine, you know, 
sometimes they'll have an article that says, oh, if you want to start an accounting firm, you know, here's the startup costs. The startup costs are usually around $25,000. You can submit that type of article to help show, well, I've spent, you know, $40,000 and I have 20 or 30,000 in working capital. And that can be very helpful, um, you know, and I think for the, for the officer. Um, if you're buying a business, then what's substantial is usually going to be considered um, the purchase price um, if it's just purchased on the open market. Uh, you know, so it, it does need to make sense kind of in light of the company's financials. So for example, if you're buying a company and it has, you know, really strong revenues and really strong, you know, um, balance sheet and, ash and assets, you know, you're purchasing it for an extremely low price from a relative, you know, that's going to be scrutinized. Um, you do want to, you know, if you're buying it on the open market, you know, then it's much less likely to be scrutinized. But if it's, you know, again, it needs to make sense in light of the financials and the company you're buying. Um, you know, franchises are a good option for E2 visas, you know, any expenses you make to purchase, um, you know, kind of the franchise, and then also to, um, you know, ancillary expenses to get things up and running for the franchise. You just want to um, make sure that in the franchise agreement that it's clear that you will have enough control of the company that you can develop and direct it. Um, because there are some franchise agreements that, you know, really restrict you as, as the, um, the investor mm -hmm. from controlling certain aspects of the business and that certain ones of that may be okay, but um, others, you know, may not. Um, so one last thing is just, there are common good and bad E2 visa expenditures, um, you know, on our website and in the E2 visa guide, there's kind of lists that, that, that you know, that go out there just to briefly summarize, um, you know, good expenditures are some of the ones we've talked about, marketing, um, you know, business entity setup, uh, you know, kind of website, you know, branding, marketing, things like that bad E2 visa expenditures, um, you know, travel, food, uh, you know, any kind of like, like hotels, if you're attending business meetings, those types of things are, um, are not going to be considered strong. Uh, you know, similarly, um, if let's say you're applying in the United States with USCIS, there are some filing fees you have to pay to the government, that's generally not going to be considered, um, you know, a good E2 expense. Um, so I do see there are several questions and we will get to those, um, you know, towards the end of the presentation. Uh, so do I have to hire employees? Um, the answer is yes, you do have to hire employees. Um, this is part of the marginality requirement. The business must support more than just the investor and their family. So if you just have yourself and your spouse working for the company, um, that's not going to ultimately work in terms of renewing. And when you apply initially, you need to submit a five-year business plan that shows that you're going to hire, um, you know, generally we recommend at least three, um, three to five full-time employees by five years of operations. Um, so, you know, W-2 employees versus 1099s, people often ask, are 1099s okay? Um, it's really kind of a sliding scale. So 1099s, um, I think if you're going to renew, you really should have a few, ideally at least three to four full-time W-2 employees. Um, if your business is the type of business where you're paying extremely large amounts to 1099s, let's say you're paying hundreds of thousands, you know, you're doing construction, you're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, to subcontractors, that can certainly be included. Um, you know, that can certainly be, uh, you know, part of the, of the application, but we'd still recommend, you know, that if possible, you try to hire at least, you know, a few W-2 employees because they're just stronger than 1099s. And 1099s are not, um, you know, they're not employees, direct employees of the company. So for your employees, um, if it's a new business, then you're going to show this basically for a business plan. Um, let's say you've hired somebody, uh, you know, but you know, obviously you don't have a W-2 yet. You know, you could do your payroll summary um, or even just proof of you paying that initial person if you haven't set up your payroll, um, you know, yet. Uh, if you're buying an existing business, you're going to want to show, you know, W-2s, pay stubs. Um, you know, any types of tax documents you have confirming that you have employees, um, a current payroll register showing your, you know, your, your current employees, and also tax returns can outline kind of the salaries and wages that you've paid. All right, do I need a business plan? So for a business plan, um, sometimes, yes. If you're starting up a new company, then yes, you do need a business plan. Um, the business plan is what helps you meet that marginality requirement to show the business is going to, um, you know, support more than just the investor and their family. The business is going to do well economically, and the business is going to hire U.S. workers. 
Um, it can also be a good snapshot to show how, you know, to really explain to the officer, what is it your business does, um, you know, and why is it going to be successful in the United States? Um, if you're purchasing an existing business and the business is already doing very well, you have three years of tax returns showing increasing revenues, good profit, good number of employees, and you intend to just take that over, then a business plan is really not as, you know, not, not as necessary because you're already going to need that marginality requirement just based on the strength of the business that you've purchased. If the business you're purchasing is not doing very well, um, then that may be something you want to submit to show how you're going to turn things around. Uh, what should your business plan contain? Um, so, you know, one thing we think is really helpful is an executive summary. Who are you? What do you do? Who do you sell to? This is often where, um, you know, the officer is really not going to spend time um, necessarily reading in detail every line of your business plan, but they will read the executive summary. And so you want it to be concise, you want it to highlight all the positives, and you want them to come away from it really understanding what it is that your business does. Um, market analysis and research is also important. This helps say, you know, there is a market for the services I'm offering. This is a growing market, um, you know, that helps show why the business will be successful. A marketing plan to explain how you will actually get clients. You know, this is, I think, particularly important for startups where you're not able to get any letters of intent or contracts ahead of time. You really want to have a strong plan that, you know, tells the officer, you know, on day one, I'm going to be able to hit the ground running because I have a website, I have a marketing plan, I'm going to do mailers, I have good word of mouth from the community, whatever it is that you're, however it is that you're going to get your clients, you want that to be really clear to the officer. Um, another good thing for the business plan is your personnel plan. Um, five years of hiring projections with job descriptions, salary amounts, and when you're going to hire employees. This helps show you'll you'll meet the marginality requirement, providing a realistic pathway, um, you know, for a potential renewal. Um, you also want to show five years of financial projections. Um, you know, explain your revenue assumptions. If you say you're going to make a million years, or I mean, I'm sorry, a million dollars within a year, you need to be able to explain why that's realistic. Um, it doesn't need to be kind of extremely, extremely detailed. Again, the officer is not going to go necessarily line by line. You want to have at least a few paragraphs that explain kind of in plain English why it is that you, like how it is you came up with these numbers. Um, you know, are you going by a billable hour? Are you going by how much inventory you plan to sell? Like, you know, just some common sense explanation for that. You also want to have your balance sheet and cash flow projections. Um, you know, to be able to show that the business is going to be able to sustain itself. Um, do you hire a professional for the business plan? Um, not necessarily. It really depends on your expertise. If you have a business background, if you feel you have the ability to um, draft a plan that incorporates all these elements we talked about, then no, you don't necessarily need to hire a professional. However, we do think that it is helpful, um, particularly to hire someone that knows how to structure a business plan for E2s because um, there's certain other types of business plans you might have, perhaps an investor pitch deck, things like that, that may not be as geared towards what the officer for the E2 is going to care about. Um, you know, they're not going to necessarily care about a month by month breakdown of the financials so much as they are a holistic snapshot of what the business is going to do. And they want to, they want that to be um, readily apparent. So, um, you know, kind of lots of pictures and things like that are not as helpful as kind of content um, that is kind of summarized in a concise and helpful way. So let's talk about some E2 uh, visa developments and adjudication trends. Um, you know, so investment purchases uh, in the United States. Um, it's not required that you make your investment in the United States. Your investment can be made outside the United States. Um, however, we do think it's helpful, particularly um, just we've heard some consular officers in recent years will sometimes ask, well, how much of this was spent in the US? And even though it's not a requirement that you spend your investment funds in the US, um, we do recommend spending at least a portion in the US. Um, it's just helpful, uh, you know, I think in the, in the officer's eyes to show that you've invested money, um, you know, directly into the United States. Uh, so let's talk about administrative processing. Um, when you apply for your visa, when you go for your visa interview, you will um, often be told at the interview either that it's approved or denied, or it could be placed into administrative processing. If your case is placed into administrative processing, you'll get a form called a 221G. 
Um, this is a technical denial of the visa, so it does impact your ESTA eligibility. If you do get a 221G, unfortunately, that means you have to reapply for ESTA. And you have to answer the question yes to whether you've had a visa refusal. Um, for administrative processing, there are different reasons. Um, sometimes it will be issued because the officer wants more documents. And in that case, they'll indicate on the form what they want from you. You'll need to submit it. And then you know, they may approve and, and issue your, um, your visa. Um, they may just need more processing time. Um, it may also have to do with uh, security checks requested by other agencies besides the consulate. So, um, you know, other agencies, you have the ability to pull the visa application and, um, you know, look into it from a security perspective. And when that's the case, the consulate really has no control over it. Um, and there is no real ability to speed that up. It's just going to remain in administrative processing until um, there's an answer given by the other agency to allow the consulate to move forward. Um, so another trend recently is kind of more USCIS filings. So because of issues with COVID causing visa appointment availability and also reluctance to travel because of COVID, um, there are more filings happening within the United States with USCIS, um, where previously your visa may be expiring and you may think, well, I'll go, you know, just go renew it abroad. Um, maybe you don't want to travel or you can't get an appointment or the consulate's really backed up. Uh, so you apply with USCIS for an extension um, or for a change of status. Uh, so an approval with USCIS does have some important key differences, uh, you know, from a visa document. So one is that when you're applying with USCIS, you can only get a two-year approval. So even if you could have gotten a five-year visa at a consulate, everyone in the U.S. is the same. If you apply for an extension or change of status to E2, the maximum time you can get is two years. Additionally, um, that two-year approval does not allow you to travel internationally. Um, once you leave, um, if you don't have a visa, then you would need to go get a visa um, to come back into the United States. And it wouldn't be as simple as just taking your approval notice and going to a consulate and getting a visa. You would actually have to submit a brand new E2 visa application, um, and the consulate will have to review that. Uh, they do not have to rely on USCIS's approval. They may look at it, but it's it, they're they're not required to follow that. Um, you know, they're not required to follow what USCIS has done. Um, you know, with USCIS, as we discussed, they are more accepting of lower investment amounts, um, so that's a benefit. However, they're very strict on the source and trail of funds. Much, much more strict than the consulates. Where the consulates may take a high level view, they may say, "Oh, you know, per you said that you." invested money from personal savings, here's your tax returns, the amounts look good, that's fine. USCIS may want to see your bank statement showing you accumulating those savings over the years, and they may take a really close look at it and look at, okay, what was your payroll? What are these other deposits? Where did they come from? Um, so if you are thinking of doing a filing with USCIS, you want to make sure you have a very clear source and trail of funds that shows the exact source of money to the exact point where it's going to be spent um, to satisfy that requirement. So let's talk um, the impact of the Biden-Harris administration um, is something people have asked about in terms of E2 adjudication trends. Um, we don't anticipate major changes to e-visa adjudications. We haven't seen any um, you know, over the years. And even in the prior administration, um, there really weren't major changes to the e-visa adjudication standards um, other than perhaps officers asking a bit more about investment purchases in the US. Uh, so right now, um, one of the biggest issues impacting E2s is um, just kind of COVID issues. Uh, so um, that's caused a lot of delays. It's caused a lot of issues at the consulates. Um, each consulate has its own procedures um, and its own timelines. Those have always varied, but it's become even more significant uh, during COVID because some consulates at this point are not even ready to uh, start processing ease again, or because of um, you know staffing shortages and, and backlogs and things like that, they have been processing ease but have now stopped processing ease. So, for example, Colombia right now is not accepting um, you know e visa application applications, uh, whereas places like London and Canada are really getting you know much closer to kind of normal processing. You know, not back to where it was previously but much, much better than it had been over the past couple of years. Um, you know, in, in terms of kind of third country national processing at different consulates, it is becoming more possible to get third country national appointments, um, you know, but there are still consulates that are not accepting it. 
Uh, and you also need to be aware that if you're going to go to a country that's not your own to get a visa, you need to be aware of the entry requirements for that country, if any. Um, you know, so there are certain consulates in Europe, such as Frankfurt and Milan, that have indicated a willingness to process third country nationals. But any requirements that they have for entering the country, um, testing, vaccination, quarantine, all of those, you know, need to be um, need to be followed. And um, you know, there's the situation is fluid, so you always want to just be, you know, sure that you're following, um, you know, what's going on in those particular countries. Um, in terms of the, you know, kind of issues for testing and vaccine. Um, for entry to the US, you always want to check the CDC website for the most updated information. It is kind of changing frequently. Um, but as of now, you know, you have to test before you can come to the United States and show proof of vaccination. And there's very limited exceptions to this. Um, if you're going to uh, renew in the United States because, you know, of these COVID issues, uh, you want to, um, or you're currently in the U.S. And, and kind of thinking about when you need to renew, you want to check your I-94. Um, that's uh, your status document. When you enter the United States on your visa, you get an I-94. Um, it's a, an electronic document. You can look it up online. Um, and you, uh, you need to make sure that that document is current. You haven't overstayed that I-94, because if you do, uh, that you know restricts your ability to extend your status in the U.S. And if you stay for long enough past your I-94 and accrue enough unlawful presence, you could be barred from entering again. Um, so that's always something you know always important to check your I-94 when you enter the U.S. But especially important now, um, where it's not as easy to just go to a consulate and get a visa. So let's turn to some issues and complex areas for E2s. Uh, you know, so source and trail of funds, particularly for USCIS filings, um, we talked about this a bit previously, uh, but ultimately um, the source of funds requirement requires a showing that the, com that the funds come from a legitimate source. At consulates, this uh, requirement is, you know, generally quite easy to meet. Um, with USCIS, it is not. It's something we really need to be able to document exactly where every single dollar came from. And if you're doing an accumulation of funds over years, you may be required to show years of, of bank statements. Um, you know, loans are something else to consider um, as complex things that come up for USCIS or for, uh, for each filings. So if the loan is secured by company assets, it is not a viable source of investment for the E2. Sometimes people come to us and, and kind of uh, describe purchase circumstances where there's going to be some type of seller financing. Um, you know, oftentimes in those cases, the seller financing is secured by the business asset. That's not acceptable for an E2, um, you know, E2 arrangement. So that couldn't be part of your E2 investment if that's the circumstance. Um, you know, for gifts, gifts are fine. Uh, but the gift giver must be willing to provide documents to show where they earned the money. So having a gift doesn't kind of erase that requirement to show it's a legitimate source of funds. You would need your gift giver to be willing to provide the documents to prove the legitimate source of funds. So if it's personal savings, their tax returns, things like that. Other areas that can come up a lot and come up a lot for our clients are kind of a smaller investment amount. So some investment amounts are just going to be too small. For example, you know, even if realistically you can start a consulting company for less than $10,000, that amount is just too small for an E2 investor visa approval. Um, when we talk about small investments, we're often talking about investments under a hundred or $150,000. Um, so that's kind of the, you know, Again, we've, we've gotten visas approved with less, you know, with closer to the fifty or sixty thousand dollar mark. But the lower you go, the weaker it makes your case, um, and the more risky it makes your case. Um, when you have a small investment amount, it's important to explain why it's substantial in light of the type of business you're starting up. So again, those marketer industry reports from respected publications that kind of outline the startup costs, and then being able to compare that favorably to what you have invested is going to be helpful in these types of cir uh, circumstances. Additionally, you wanna make sure all other parts of your application are strong. So make sure that the real and operating parts are strong, have a very detailed business plan with financials, be able to show contracts or letters of intent for people that want to work with you. Um, you could also join a local chamber of commerce um, and they may be willing to write a letter explaining they're interested in your business, they're happy your business is bringing jobs to their area. Those types of things can also be helpful to show you've made inroads in the local business community. Um, 
Another thing that comes up is kind of E2 visas for two investors. If you are both applying for E2 visas as investors, then ownership has to be 50 50. Um, ideally, you're investing about an equal amount. Um, for example, if someone's investing 100,000 and someone's investing 10,000, that may be better as an E2 investor slash employee um, case as opposed to two investors because the person investing 10,000, it's going to be very hard to argue they made a substantial investment on their own. Um, another thing is if you are doing um, the, this with a partner, sometimes consults will allow you to be interviewed together if you're going to be applying at the same time, but it's very consult specific. So you want to just discuss with your attorney to see what the best way is to, um, to go about that. It's also important when you're doing this that you want to demonstrate that you'll each have a role in developing and directing the company. So um, it can be helpful as well to identify specific roles for each of you. Um, you know, perhaps one of you is more um, a big picture person and the other one is better operationally. So perhaps you identify as a CEO and a COO. Um, those are the types of things that can be helpful in, in kind of making those arguments with, with two E2 investors. Another complex area that comes up sometimes is um, after you get your visa, um, any substantive changes to your business. So if there are any changes in ownership structure, you want to discuss this with your attorney before those happen. Um, the business does always need to be owned at least 50% by treaty country nationals in order to qualify as an E2 business. Um, so if you yourself drop below 50%, um, you know, then technically, you know, Counting as an investor is going to be difficult or you know, not possible. Um, but if the, if the company is still owned 50% or more by treaty country nationals, then um, you, know, you could be an, you know, reframed as an E2 employee, but that's something where you'd have to proactively notify the consulate first. Um, other things that can happen are you know, changes in the type of business. Um, so if your business is changing drastically, so for example, you had a consulting company, now you wanna turn it into a restaurant, um, you need to get approval before you can start your new line of business. Um, so, you know, you are limited to doing what you explained you were going to do at the consulate, um, you know, when you went. Uh, sometimes if you add things into your business plan that are related, so let's say you, you went for a software consultancy and you added in your business plan, you were going to be doing app development. So you don't need to go back to the consulate now if you start doing app development because you've already explained that you were going to do that in your initial business plan. But if you're completely changing your business line, uh, that's something that needs approval before you can actually start um, you know, running, running the new business. Another thing that comes up a lot, um, family business purchases. So if you are purchasing a business from a family member, um, you are going to want to do a little bit more um, to show that this is that the amount you're investing is really legitimate. So these types of arrangements are inherently more um, open to scrutiny from the officers. Um, it's good to get a third party valuation or provide some objective documents, um, you know, the tax returns, a statement from the CPA, um, you know, the audited financial statements that are showing that the amount you're purchasing the business for makes sense in light of the value of the business. Okay, so common reasons, uh, you know, for E2 denials. Um, so one is a low investment amount. Um, you know, as we discussed, some investments are just too low. Uh, you know, we did have a client um, came to us once, he had put $98,000 into a business bank account and spent $2,000. And, you know, that case was denied because $2,000 spent is just too low. Um, once he came to us, he asked about, you know, what, where he could spend more money. We advised him on other areas to spend money, went back to the consulate and was approved. Um, so if you are denied for a low investment amount and you have more money to invest, um, or perhaps you had a lot of cash, but you didn't spend a lot of it, this can be a relatively easy fix. Um, you know, you can reinvest more, you know, more money and then you can reapply at the consulate. A denial does not prevent you from reapplying. Um, you could also gather more evidence to support that your investment amount is substantial. Um, so those market reports, things like that, you could also have a CPA review your business plan and your investment schedule um, and write a letter confirming that the investment is substantial in light of the startup costs. Um, this is helpful if the CPA is one that works with your type of business um, and can really speak to that, um, what startup costs are for this type of business. Um, another reason could be the nature of the business. So some businesses are riskier than others. Um, for example, consulting businesses 
where there's no proof of contracts and you don't have any employees yet. Um, I think the officers are often concerned that someone is just going to come into the US and operate as a freelance consultant and won't hire employees. And so um, those types of businesses can be more suspect. Similarly, real estate, um, if the business has anything to do with real estate or with property, like house flipping, they're very sensitive to that. Um, they're concerned that people are going to buy one house come to the U.S. and sell the house and it's just kind of a passive, um, you know, real estate ownership situation and not an active um, company. So we have an entire webinar that kind of talks more about um, these types of risky businesses and ways that you can um, approach that. Uh, so, you know, I, I recommend kind of looking at our website for more detail, you know, about kind of those types of businesses and how to mitigate some of that risk. Um, Another thing that can come up for E2 denials is kind of just your filing location, your venue. So some consulates are more E2 friendly than others. Um, for example, Toronto and London are two consulates that are very E2 friendly in the sense that they have officers that are very familiar with the requirements. Um, they process, you know, many, many E2 visas and they have a very organized system for it. Um, you know, again, you know, USCIS is less concerned with issues like lower investment amount but they're going to require a dollar for dollar accounting of your source and trail of funds. So if you have a really complex source and trail of funds, a consulate may be a better venue for you. So it's, it's good to, you know, you don't necessarily have options to pick and choose any consulate you want. Um, you know, but it is a good idea to discuss with your immigration attorney to see what might work best given your factual situation. Um, so another, you know, issue for denial, if you've, run a similar business in your home country for many years and you've never hired employees, it can be very hard to overcome that. Um, as part of the develop and direct requirement, we include your resume to show that you have the ability to run the company. And you know, let's say you spent 10 years as a freelance consultant. Um, it's going to be difficult to convince the officer that you're actually going to hire people. Um, one way to combat that is to actually hire someone to get things started before you apply. Um, that can help kind of you know, mitigate that risk. Um, you know, you, there's also concern over whether the business is going to, um, you know, create jobs for U.S. workers. That's similar to, um, you know, if you've run a company for many years and you haven't hired anyone, you know, there, there's going to be that concern. You could also have issues with the adjudicating officer. Um, you know, most of the time the officers are quite pleasant, but every now and then we do have clients that have run into an officer that um, is, is not pleasant. Um, you know, officers do have complete discretion over whether to grant or deny the visa, and there's no appeal process. Um, so you do want to be as polite as possible, even if the officer is taking a, um, you know, a difficult tack with you. Uh, if you reapply, most consulates will make the effort to give you a different officer. Uh, however, that isn't guaranteed. So something to keep in mind. Um, another reason for denial is just if you didn't meet the requirements at the time of filing. Uh, so perhaps, you know, if you filed on your own or the file just didn't have what was needed, you know, perhaps you don't have the correct, um, you know, ownership of the company uh, or one of your, you know, business partners is a legal permanent resident and they own a majority share, uh, you know, and that can't count for the um, treaty country nationality, those types of things. Um, so that's, you know, a good reason to hire an attorney ahead of time who can kind of assess your case and make sure you meet those, um, those requirements at the time of filing. So what does it take to renew an E-2 visa? Um, hiring U.S. workers is very key. Uh, some consulates will only ask to see W-2s and tax returns upon renewal, showing that the most important thing they wanna see is that jobs were created. Um, again, if your industry is largely based on paying independent contractors, you can argue that this counts to show the company is supporting more than you and your family, but it's a weaker argument. And if you're going to do that, the amount paid to independent contractors should be quite high, you know, in the hundreds of thousands, ideally. Um, you know, we do recommend three full-time workers, um, you know, W-2s by five years. Uh, the salary doesn't matter as long as you're paying, you know, minimum wage, like a legal salary, you know, for the, for the area that, you're, um, that your business is located in. Um, additionally, if you have a type of, let's say you are running a juice shop and it's very common to have, you know, 10 part-time workers, that's fine. Um, you know, that, that number is good, uh, but we'd still recommend you try to have at least one or two full-time workers. Um, it's just helpful to the application. Um, you also have to provide updated financial data. So usually tax returns for, you know, two or three years, 
Um, you know, they may also want to see, um, you know, profit and loss statements and balance sheets for the current, uh, the current year. Uh, it's helpful if um, you had a business plan and your company met or exceeded its revenue targets. It can be helpful to explain that. Um, you want to show if the company is profitable, it's good to mention that. If the company's profit is on the lower side, that's generally okay, as long as the revenues are increasing and the company is able to hire employees. If the company is continuing to make a loss, um, you know, that's something where you really need to be able to explain. Like if there's been some fluctuation, that's okay. But if there's just continuous losses, um, you know, that's going to be um, something you'll need to address in the, you know, in the application to explain how you're going to turn things around. Um, they'll also want to see payroll information, as we talked about W-2s and 1099s. Um, you know, so let's say you've hired people over the years, but there's been employee turnover. You still want to mention that. You still want to include those W-2s to show you've hired workers, um, you know, and um, it's natural for there to be employee turnover, but it's helpful for the application. Let's say you hired 10 people over the years and you currently have a staff of four, that's fine. You would still mention that you hired 10 people and due to employee turnover, you currently have a staff of four. Um, it's also helpful in your um, application to explain, did your marketing and sales plan work? Um, has your business volume been increasing? Some consulates you know, want to see more than just the tax returns and W-2s. And in that case, you might submit things like new lucrative contracts that you've signed, um, you know, updated like commercial office space, um, you know, any kind of positive reviews of your business and in media or online, things like that can also be very helpful. Um, if your company is not doing well, uh, you know, you can include kind of an updated mini business plan explaining what's happened and you have plans to hire employees um, and what those plans are. Perhaps if you've already paid for job advertisements and put them out there, you can include that. Um, you also want to be able to show in your renewal application the company still meets the E2 requirements. So they may ask about ownership changes. Um, when you submit your tax returns, there's usually going to be, um, you know, if it's in a partnership or it's in a uh, you know, corp corporation, there's usually going to be an area that outlines what the ownership is. They will often ask to see that as confirmation that there's still um, at least 50% ownership by treaty country nationals. And if you're an investor, at least 50% ownership by you. Um, additionally, if there's been a change to the type of business you're doing or expansion of your business services, that's going to have to be mentioned or should be mentioned. Um, again, if it's if the business has just kind of shifted, like let's say you were going to do a marketing agency with a niche in finance companies, but instead you became a marketing agency with a niche in healthcare companies, that's completely fine. Um, but again, if the business change is so substantive, like consulting company to restaurant, that would have had to have been approved ahead of time. And if you haven't mentioned it and now you're going to renew, that could be, that could be an issue. All right, so we've reached the end of the presentation and I will start going through some of the questions. Um, so uh, um, someone's asked, can I be in the due diligence stage of buying a business whilst on a valid different visa and apply for the E2? Um, so I think, Generally, yes, uh, it does depend, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what visa status you're on, um, but it's fine as long as you have a professional who's, due, like, let's say you're on an F1 that doesn't permit work, um, or, okay, you're on an L1B, um, you know, so that's fine, um, but you should basically have, you know, you're only permitted on your L1B to work for the company that you're currently working for, so as long as you have a professional doing the due diligence for you, um, you know, then, then that's fine because they're really doing the due diligence for you. Uh, okay. Is there any chance to get a green card from the E2? Um, so it, it doesn't, while you're on the E2, if a green card is available to you, you can apply for a green card. Um, we actually have a webinar that's completely on this topic. So I'd recommend kind of looking at our website, signing up for the future webinars on this, and also looking at our YouTube channel, which has copies of, um, you know, the other videos we've done. Um, on this topic, but yes, it's possible to apply for a green card while you're on an E2. There's no kind of direct path, um, but there's many different ones that you could potentially consider, including EB-5 if you're making an investment, national interest waiver if you have a you know endeavor of substantial merit and national importance. And so I, I'd, I'd say you know check out that webinar. It kind of goes into much more detail about that. Um, I'm setting up a business which is 80% done, but in the process of getting a venue, I want you to buy a similar business and run the new business there. Is this okay? Um, 
So for the E2, it's company specific. Um, you get the visa to, to work for one company. Um, so if you are bringing that similar business under the same LLC or same corporation, and they're all going to operate under that one LLC or corporation as one entity, yes, that's possible. Um, if you are talking about you know, having kind of a parent subsidiary or two separate entities, you're only going to get the E2 for one um, one business and you could have a management services agreement or business to business agreement with the other company if you wanted to um, if you wanted to also run that other company. Um, how much time ahead to apply for an E2 renewal? We usually contact our clients about nine months ahead of time. Um, it's gotten even more towards a year, largely just because it depends vastly on the, where you're applying. Um, you know, it just really depends because some consulates are barely even functioning and others are processing almost as normal. Um, so it, it, it just depends, but um, probably about a year ahead of time is a good time to talk to your attorney to start figuring out, you know, what is the, what is the plan. Um, for consulting businesses, where should we invest the money and what are the expenses apart from an hourly wage for a W-2 employee? Uh, so I, I recommend looking at our E2 visa guide. Um, there's lots of different um, ideas there, including ones we've talked about during this, um, this presentation already, marketing, website, NB setup, legal fees, um, you know, software licenses, all those types of things. Um, so there's, there's lots of information out there and including on our blog. Um, whilst in the due diligence phase of purchasing a business, can the investment deposit be shown as an investment into the business? So the transfer of the amount into the seller's attorney's escrow account. Um, uh, yes, you, you can um, have an escrow arrangement where you add the deposit into the um, escrow account, um, that, that is fine. Uh, but then before actually purchasing a business, the full purchase price should be moved into the escrow account as well. Um, can we start a second business with a second LLC? Uh, so you, um, your E2 visa is only granted for, your B, for the um, company that you got your E2 visa for. So no, you cannot directly, you can be a passive owner of a second LLC, but you cannot start up a second LLC and just start running it without any other prior approvals. Um, you know, generally, if you want to start up a second LLC and have, you know, you could potentially have a management services agreement where that second LLC is hiring your E2 company, not you as an individual, but your E2 company for, um, for, for services. Uh, we have to renew our E2 visa. We're from Germany. We're not vaccinated with current travel restrictions. We can't come back to the US. The only option we filing with USCIS. Uh, so yes, if you if you don't meet the requirements for entry into the United States, um, you would need to, to file with USCIS. Uh, purchasing a business, can you show the previous owner's W-2 payroll with the intention to continue employing the staff? Yes, you can. All right, um, a few more questions. Um, visas for Pakistani nationals can be issued for, uh, um, I believe, for five years. Um, but then when you come to the United States, you can only get... Uh, the um, the visa, or you can only get it, you know, you come in for two years at a time. Um, the initial investment be an amount paid as a deposit into the business. So the deposit can be part of the investment, but generally it cannot it cannot be the entire investment. If like if the purchase price of the business is a hundred thousand dollars and you've invested 20,000 in the deposit, you know, the remainder would need to be in escrow, um, you know, before you could apply uh, for the E2. Um, you have to, okay, we've already seen that. If I have a single entry visa, can I go to Canada or Mexico and re-entry the country again without having a new visa? Um, potentially, yes, if you meet the requirements for automatic revalidation, um, which are more specific, um, and I would recommend, you know, so, so potentially, yes. Um, can I go over what a business article is again? I'm sorry, I'm not sure what that, I'm not sure what that question means. Um, can an E2 visa holder have more than one business in the US? You can have more than one business line and yes, you can have more than one business, but you're only going to get a visa for, um, uh, you're only going to get your visa for uh, one particular company. Um, you can sometimes go to the consulate and if you can prove each individual company meets the E2 requirements, you may be able to get the visa for the multiple businesses, but it's an outlier situation. Um, my business doesn't require an office since my customers contact us via email. Um, 
we don't need an office. How can I overcome this requirement? So the E2 visa is not like the L. It doesn't require an office space by regulation. It's just very helpful, um, you know, to show that the business has one, particularly if it's a startup. But there's many businesses that don't require one, particularly in the remote world. And if you're renewing and your company is doing well and you have employees, but you've given up your office space on in light of COVID, it's not doesn't prevent you from 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 renewing. Um, okay. Uh, if my employees or my relatives who are U.S. citizens, will it be acceptable? Um, you should have employees beyond your relatives. Uh, you know, yes, you may be able to include some of them, but it's, it's you know, you're also going to need to have additional employees who aren't your relatives. Um, okay. Isn't Columbia currently accepting E2 visa applications? At this moment, um, you know, when things are submitted to them, they are saying no. They're saying that they're not accepting new E2s at this point, and they hope to resume the process in a few months. So we're continuing to follow that closely, but unfortunately, no. Um, it doesn't mean you can't continue to apply, uh, you know, but it just will take likely a long time. Um, while waiting for the purchase of the business, can I show my apartment rental lease as a form of investment? Uh, no, uh, residential leases cannot be part of your, your E2 investment. Um, what other documentation aside from a contract to purchase the business and money would move into escrow would support the E2 documentation? Um, if you're doing a purchase of a business, then um, you, know, you still need to meet all the other E2 requirements we talked about, it's too lengthy to go through now. Um, but in terms of the investment portion, it, you would need to be the full purchase price would need to be put into escrow. The only condition for release being the approval of the E2 visa. Um, at the time of the application, must you have full-time employees? No, if it's a startup, you can submit a business plan and explain you will have full-time employees you know, by five years. Um, if you're purchasing a business, generally either the previous tax returns or the um, financial statements are helpful to show if it's an asset purchase, there's more flexibility. Um, but yes, usually you want to. Uh, what are the chances to get an E2 if we took out PPP and other COVID relief loans? Um, I paid my husband. He did not have an ED. So the, quite a lot going on there. Um, you know, PPP and other relief loans, if they've been paid back and you were, you were eligible for them and you took them, not necessarily a problem as long as kind of the business is, is kind of back on its feet now. Um, you know, in terms of paying when paying a spouse, uh, you know, when they don't have an EAD, E2 spouses now are authorized to work incident to status in many circumstances. So, um, you know, that uh, issue is getting better. Um, if we have an LLC, my husband owns 51% of me, 49. My husband is the E2B, so I'm the dependent. Will that work? Yes, that's, that's fine. Uh, estimated processing times in the U.S. If you're applying with USCIS, uh, then you can pay for premium processing. It's $2,500. You can get an answer in 15 calendar days. If you don't pay uh, for premium processing, it's taking uh, several months, uh, you know, anywhere from kind of six to eight or even more, uh, more months. Um, Chile is also not processing E2s right now. It's on pause. Um, you know, we are hope like they do need to start processing visas again. Um, it is, you know, there, there is kind of um, different organizations putting pressure on the consulates to do this, but because of consular staffing shortages, um, you know, it's been, um, been difficult. So right now they are also similar to Columbia, um, not, um, you know, not actively accepting new cases, but we hope they uh, will start to do so soon. Is it better to have, um, I think this means, is it better to have a franchise for the E2? Um, I think a benefit of a franchise is if it's successful, uh, you know, then there's a basis for the consulate to, um, you know, have more faith that the company will ultimately be successful because you will have these, um, you know, this kind of successful franchise and branding kind of already available to you. So I think that that can be helpful. Um, does the full purchase price need to be an escrow residing in a business bank account? Uh, yes, the full purchase price needs to be an escrow. Uh, do I still have to apply for an EAD as a spouse? Uh, so you don't. Um, a new change for spouses. Um, if uh, you are an E2 spouse, uh, you know, check your I-94. If it says E2S, then you are permitted to work using that I-94 in your visa stamp. Um, if it doesn't say that and you, you know, have a valid visa, you can leave and re-enter the United States. Um, starting January 31st is when they started making those changes to the I-94. If you re-entered the U.S. before then, they won't make the update for you from within the U.S. You would have to travel internationally. If you've traveled into the U.S. since January 31st and your I-94 is just incorrect, they didn't add the S, 
you can contact the deferred inspection office where you opened, I mean, where you entered and get the, um, the, the correction. Um, additionally, if you applied through USCIS for your E2 dependent status, then they should be mailing you um, an updated approval notice that indicates you are authorized to work incident to status. And there's also more information on that um, on, our, uh, on our blog if you're interested in that. Um, so I think we have we have reached the end, and uh, I really appreciate all of your questions and you taking the time to um, to watch this webinar. And uh, as I mentioned, the webinar will be uh, made available to you. It has been recorded and will be made available to you along with our PowerPoints um, and links to additional webinars. So thank you, everyone, and have a nice day.